As we start momentum, uh, we're going to start with the idea of center of mass. And we're going to talk about center of mass of objects and the center of mass of systems. And uh, it's a great way to simplify things, uh, to basically take physics and kind of make it more logical uh, and help us mathematically. And uh, what we're saying with the object's center of mass or center of mass of system is that all of the mass of an object is located at its center. So it's the main thing we're trying to say with center of mass. The other things that are important about its center of mass is that it's the balance point for an object, and the object rotates or spins about its center of mass. For most of the things we deal with in physics, uh, the objects center of mass will will fall right at the center of the object so if we take a meter stick that is one meter long its center of mass should be 0.5 meters away from the edge so right in its center but typically what the college board is interested in you finding out is the center of mass of of a system of objects so what we have here is mass one mass two and mass 3, all of them uh, different masses and set up certain distances from each other. So once we have our distances and the mass of each object, we can find the location of, of the center of mass of the objects. And how we do that is take the mass and position of each object and add them together. So mass 1, position 1, plus mass 2, position 2, plus mass 3, position 3 and it will all be divided by what we call the total effective mass which is the addition of all their masses so mass 1 plus mass 2 plus mass 3 and and when we do the math there uh, we have 1 times 0 because the first object is at, is at position 0 and 2 times 1 plus 3 times 2 all over the total effective mass and we get 8 over 6 meters or 1 and 2 6 meters or 1 and 1 third meters but basically we find that our center of mass is located just short, just partly beyond one meter, in between one and two meters, a third of the distance away from one meter, or two-thirds of the distance away from two meters. You get the point, that we can locate where the center of mass is. So now we get to pretend that all of the mass in the system is located at that particular point. I'm just going to continue to write that out so that you can write it in your notes. Something else we can do is we could place, and I've already started the drawing here, and we could place a fulcrum on a meter stick. And when we place that fulcrum on the meter stick, we can then uh, create that as like the pivot point or the axis. And we can consider that to be the center of mass. And we can add a mass on one side that we'll call mass 2. So we can just put a weight on there, mass 2, some distance away from the center of mass, and we'll call that x2. And then we'll also have the meter stick itself it has all of its mass at the center of mass of the meter stick which is some distance away from the fulcrum point and uh, knowing the mass that we put onto the meter stick so mass 2 we'll know the mass of that and since it is a meter stick we could find the distance away from the fulcrum we should know the mass of the meter stick and the distance it is away from the fulcrum because it is on a meter stick it's easy to lo locate the distances we can also now find the mass of the system. We can use the equation over here on the right, this formula here, to find the mass of the system. So using the fulcrum as the balance point and recognizing the other two masses, the mass of the meter stick and the mass of, of the weight or the weight, you know, the object we placed on the meter stick as parts of the system, we're able to find the uh, total mass of the entire system using the same formula. 
Um, so now let's look at center of mass in two dimensions. So when looking at the center of mass in two dimensions, what we're going to do is we're going to place four objects in a coordinate plane. Uh, they're going to be one meter away from the origin in the y direction and one meter away from the origin in the x direction. And we have the four masses labeled each with their own mass, two kilograms, two kilograms, two kilograms, and four kilograms. And we'll go ahead and label them as mass one, two, three, and four, like there in blue, like you see. And what you end up having to do is you end up having to separate it out into its position of center mass in the x direction and its position of center mass in the y direction. So for object one, it's two kilograms at position zero plus two kilograms at position zero for object two. It's still x direction is zero plus four kilograms one meter away in the x direction plus two kilograms one meter away in the x direction divided by its total effective mass which should be 10 kilograms. Uh, 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 4 is 10. Um, of course, you can do that. Uh, the position of center mass in the y direction, uh, again, we start with the object 1, which has no displacement in the y direction. Object 2 has 1 meter up, so 2 kilograms times 1, plus object 3, which is 1 meter in the y direction, which is 4 kilograms times 1. And then object four, which is not anywhere in the y direction, it is on the x-axis, so it's two kilogram two kilograms times zero, and divide it by its total effective mass. And we end up with a coordinate where the center of mass will be for this two-dimensional system, and it's easy to look at it in a coordinate plane. So now we can look at uh, a continuous object instead of looking at them like several different masses and the continuous object, object would be a loop of wire which is uh, an, an example of a question you could see on the AP test uh, other than rotation questions when it deals with center of mass. Uh, so you could see something along like a continuous object which is a loop of wire which you see here. Now in order to solve something like this, uh, you have to assume that each side of the wire has an even mass of density and reduce the side of the loop of wire to a point. So what we end up doing is creating a point for each side of the loop of wire and placing it on a coordinate plane. And since it was one meter on each side of the loop of wire, we recognize that if the one side, the left side of the loop of wire, at a center of mass in the center, it is 0.5 meters away from its edge, and we've located all of its mass at its center, and each one of them would be 0.5 meters from its edge, and it has its mass located at its center. So what we have done is we've reduced each side of the loop of wire to a point mass, in essence. So all of this is for the center of mass location. Uh, you know, we have the point masses there, and we're finding the center of mass, mass location. And now we're going to go take a, a gander at the center of mass for velocity, so or velocity of center of mass. So now we have a mass of one kilogram, mass one is one kilogram, mass two is one kilogram, and each of the objects are moving toward each other, mass one at two meters per second, and mass two at one meter per second. If we tried to look at this as position of center of mass and use the formula that we know, what we recognize is that the objects are moving in respect to time. So since they're moving in respect of time and they're not stationary objects and they're not worried only about their position, if we were to divide them by time, what we end up having the issue is is that it becomes a velocity equation. Uh, we have position over the change in time and then you'll have mass 1 in its position over change in time and mass 2 in its position over change in time and then it becomes a, a, a function of, of time and position and position as a function of time is velocity. So now we have to look at it as uh, mass 1 times velocity 1 plus mass 2 times velocity 2 over its total effective mass. Now Newton's first law is basically saying uh, that if you had 
an object with constant velocity would continue to move with a constant velocity unless a, a, an unbalanced net force acted on the object. Or it could be called Galileo's Law of Motion, whichever one uh, you choose to use if you're a history guy and um, which one came first. You can look that up yourself if you'd like. But basically, Newton's first law of motion will tell us that if we have a velocity of center of mass and there are no outside forces acting on our object, then the velocity of center of mass will remain constant. It will remain as is. So if we truly follow Newton's first law and the velocity of center mass of this system of our two carts traveling toward each other, if there are no outside forces acting on the object, the velocity of center mass of that system will remain the same, remain the same no matter what happens to those objects in that system. So the question you might be asking yourself at this moment is, well, what if these two objects, these two masses hit each other? Well, if they come in contact with each other and create a force, they are, it is an internal force. So as long as there's no net external force acting on this object to change its motion, it's an internal force, like, like you punching yourself in the face. I mean, yeah, you, you could cause damage, of course, but it doesn't change you. It doesn't change what's going on there. So the the two objects have internal forces acting on them. It doesn't change the velocity of center of mass. It has to be a net external force acting on the object for it to change the system. So when this occurs, when the net outside force of an object is zero, then the velocity of center of mass of the system should remain constant. As long as Newton's first law remains the way it is, and nothing changes to it, we can assume these things. So now let's take a look at velocity of center of mass when it's zero. So an object or a system where the velocity of center of mass is zero. We covered this in class today, so what we have is we have a boy on a boat, and the boat is attached to the dock, and the boy has a mass of 50 kilograms, and the boat itself has a mass of 100 kilograms. And all of that boat's mass is located at the center of mass of the boat. Uh, and the boat is 5 meters long. So let's find the position of center mass. And we do 50 kilograms times 5 meters because that's how far away the boy is from the dock. And we have 100 kilograms times 2.5 meters because that's how far the center of mass is from the dock divided by the total effective mass. And we get 250 kilogram meters plus 250 kilogram meters divided by 150 kilograms. And the kilograms cancel. And we end up with a position of center of mass is 3.3 meters from the dock we can locate at this point. If we look at that again as if the boy traveled and walked across the boat to the other side of the boat, the position of center of mass for the system has not changed. The center of mass will still be 3.3 meters away from the dock. But the boat may have moved. And so what we look at, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself here in the video, what we look at is that uh, in the previous example over here on the left that the center of mass was 2.5 of the boat is was 2.5 meters from the dock and the center of mass of the boat boy system was 3.3 meters from the dock so there is a little distance of 0.83 meters there between the center of mass of the boat boy system and the center of mass of the boat and it's 0.83 meters in distance there and you can see I've labeled it we'll have that exact same distance between the center of mass of the boat boy system and the center of mass of the boat as you see I've labeled here on the right. So the boat boy system, it, it system's chain, center of mass is zero. It is not necessarily moving and it will not move. Even if the boy and the boat, or the boy starts to move along the boat, the system of objects were initially at zero and then he began to move that system of objects will have the same center of mass, uh, velocity center of mass of zero. Even as the boy begins to move to the other side, the two objects will react in opposite directions, canceling each other's motion out, and so we have a velocity of center of mass of zero. Um, and so you can really recognize how far away he is from the dock, and you can calculate that with those things. And this is all because of Newton's first law of motion. So the key thing that allows me to attack this problem as if the velocity of center of mass is zero is the boat 
buoy system is not moving. The buoy standing on one end of the boat, let's just say he's fishing on that end of the boat and it's attached to the dock and the whole system is not moving. Well, all of a sudden he decides to be done fishing and he wants to walk to the other end. Well, initially the velocity of center of mass was zero and then he decides to walk to the other end. So if he has a velocity now, the boat has to react in the opposite direction with a velocity, canceling out each other's velocity to where they have a zero velocity for the system and it causes a an issue here because now the boat the buoy is too far from the dock to you know walk across unless the boat was tied by some rope and then we have to talk about force and tension and things of that nature and we're we're not there yet so if the center of mass at the beginning was zero at the end of the momentum that has occurred or the movement has occurred here the velocity of center of mass will also be zero and we'll go over this more in class if need to and we'll go also go over more velocity of center of mass as we move into collisions uh, in the next video.